So today we're going to talk about something called eugenics and crypto eugenics, what it really is, and how it unlocks the door to some of the most important hidden history you've never heard about. So first and foremost, eugenics is an extreme form of population control, guys, where a small group of elitists believe they are superior to everybody else genetically, and therefore they have a right and in fact a duty to control the rest of society. And when I say control, I mean to the point that they control who gets to have babies and procreates and who does not. Now, some of you may have heard of eugenics from the establishment media, which unfortunately is always a very bad place to start. And the reason why is because they are trying to make it seem as though eugenics is about nothing more than white supremacy and racism which is extremely misleading. So for example, this article from The Guardian where they note how a prominent eugenist by the name of Sir Ronald Fisher had his commemoration taken down, but they give no insight whatsoever to what eugenics actually is. They just say that this was inspired by, and I quote, anti-racist protesters as part of a campaign called Topple the Racist, which was inspired by Black Lives Matter. Another example is the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, who was in fact a member of the American Eugenics Society and a life fellow of the British Eugenics Society. In story after story, they too make it seem as though she was nothing more than a racist with links to white supremacy. And then this one over here is just an excellent example of how insidious these propagandists can be, guys, regarding the involvement in eugenics of major foundations like the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations, where they unbelievably and so deceptively use an image of a Black Lives Matter protest as their main thumbnail. And the caption reads, a White Lives Matter rally was shut down by Black Lives Matter. And they too go on to talk about white supremacy, systemic racism, and so on and so forth. The reality, guys, is that Sir Ronald Fisher, Margaret Sanger, the Rockefeller Network, like virtually every other prominent eugenist there was, wanted to eliminate white people they considered to be unfit and inferior to. So, for example, the founder of the Rockefeller Foundation, John D. Rockefeller Jr., he helped finance the earliest so-called science studies in America into sterilizing those he considered to be inferior and not worthy of continuing their bloodlines, and these folks were exclusively poor white people. Another example is a place called the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, where several thousand people were sterilized, and all of them, such as Carrie Buck, were in fact whites. Now, there are still many other examples, guys, but my point is very simple. Although white supremacy and racism are indeed branches of eugenics, the much deeper root from which it all grows is elitism and classism. In fact, in China, there was the Hong Kong Eugenic Society, which was made up of Chinese elitists who were closely with white elitists, such as Margaret Sanger, who was an honorary member of the club. Likewise, in India, there were several eugenic societies doing the same thing. In Japan, they had strong eugenical laws, which in more recent times, victims were compensated for. And then when crypto eugenics came into being after World War II, a topic that we will address momentarily, individuals from all over the world, they began to engage in extreme forms of population control programs that were aimed at people within their own native countries. So why is the establishment media being so misleading about this? Well, by promoting tribalism, you know, black versus white, which is something that the ruling class does all the time anyways, not only does this create division and therefore prevent unity, which is the only thing they truly fear, but it also creates distraction about the topic of eugenics, which if investigated closely, reveals how the ruling class for well over a century have waged a population control war against the common people. Now, before we get into some of this hidden history, for those brand new to the topic, the official founder of eugenics was a guy by the name of Sir Francis Galton, who was a pioneering scientist. In his book, Memories of My Life, Galton explained that the precise aim of eugenics is first to check the birth rate of the so-called unfit, and second, furthering the productivity of the fit. Now, he defined the unfit as those who are seriously afflicted by lunacy, feeble-mindedness, habitual criminality, and pauperism. And yes, pauperism applies to those who had the misfortune of being born very poor. Unsurprisingly, this douchebag was born into a rich banking family and never knew a day of financial hardship in his entire life. Now, in Galton's twisted worldview, this extreme form of population control was really a form of self-defense in a clandestine war between the ruling class and those he considered to be inferior, which became a popular perspective with his supporters and followers. And ultimately, what Galton hoped, guys, was that eugenics would become sort of like a new religion for the ruling class, which is pretty much what it did. Now, another major figure in the eugenics movement was the famous scientist Charles Darwin, who in fact was Sir Francis Galton's cousin and close friend. Now, although Darwin is held up as some sort of infallible angelic priest in the field of science... <laughs> 
he was undeniably a prejudiced bigot. If we read his book, The Descent of Man, for example, not only does he quote and promote the work of his cousin, Francis Galton, but he quotes another elitist author that states, the careless, squalid, unaspiring Irishman multiplies like a rabbit, <laughs> which invariably results in the inferior race prevailing in society. And this, again, is why these twisted elitists call their war against the unsuspecting average individual self-defense. Now, the Darwin and Galton families as a whole proved to be major forces in the field of eugenics. Major Leonard Darwin, Charles Darwin's son, for example, he became the president of the British Eugenics Society and played a key role in spreading this elitist religion of eugenics to others worldwide. Now, the most notable adoptee, guys, was the United States, where it took on an entire new dimension and life of its own. Some of the most notable and early supporters were John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and Mrs. E. H. Harriman, collectively representing more wealth on the planet than anyone else during that time. Now, under the banner, of course, of science and humanitarianism, they came to call for an unprecedented population control program, which included the sterilization of 15 million people within the United States alone. Now, although this is portrayed today by the establishment as simply being a product of those times and therefore normal, Example after example clearly shows that the average person and those who had the courage to challenge the establishment viewed eugenics as ridiculous and insane. Nonetheless, because the most powerful people subscribed to this elitist crusade, it was widely adopted by the elites of the science community, leading educators, prominent government officials, religious authorities, and so on and so forth. In fact, from 1907 to 1932, a majority of states had passed eugenics laws allowing the ruling class to sterilize anyone they considered unfit of having children. And this is where it gets really crazy, guys. Because the eugenics laws in America and the eugenics establishment at large, they ultimately inspired a young up-and-coming politician by the name of Adolf Hitler. Now, when I first began to learn about this, guys, it just blew my mind because we've been told over and over and over again about how evil Hitler was in Nazi Germany, but we are never given the full story that A, they were inspired by what they saw taking place in the United States, and B, what happened in Nazi Germany was all about eugenics, but it gets crazier because the eugenics program in Germany that culminated in what we recognize today as the Holocaust, that was in fact funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. If we quote the internationally renowned professor Stefan Kuhl, for example, he notes that the Rockefeller Foundation played the central role in establishing and sponsoring major eugenic institutes in Germany. And then if we quote a Tisch scholar by the name of Leo Weintraub, she states that the Germans' early work in eugenics would not have been possible without the extensive support of the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, in a forthcoming video, I will expose how the Rockefeller interests were also pivotal in the rise of Nazi Germany militarily. For now, though, let's get back to the story at hand. Now, in addition to these very interesting points, a close friend of John D. Rockefeller Jr., a guy by the name of Madison Grant, who was the co-founder of the American Eugenics Society, he wrote a book entitled The Passing of the Great Race, where he argued that the superior race was Nordic people personified through features like blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> Now, a young Hitler read this book, and it had such a profound influence on his worldview that he later came to refer to it as, and I quote, my Bible. Now, initially, leading eugenists from America came to praise the sterilization eugenics program in Nazi Germany, such as was the case with prominent American Eugenics Society member and future president, Frederick Osborne, who called the Nazi sterilization program an excellent one and one of the most important experiments in history. Now, as the world became aware of the crazy shit that was going on in Nazi Germany, and the face of eugenics was exposed not as a humanitarian scientific campaign, but a campaign of genocide, leading eugenists around the world, most notably the US, began to distance themselves, at least on the surface, from eugenics. Now, as numerous credentialed authorities have detailed, such as Edwin Black, Linda Gordon, Emily Clauncher Merchant, and Matthew Connolly, these elites began to rebrand themselves as population control, family planning, and environmentalism, amongst other things. But to summarize their strategy, we can actually turn to a letter that was written by a prominent member of the British Eugenics Society, who in turn became a founding member of Planned Parenthood International, Carlos Patton Blacker. And what Blacker cites is the aforementioned Frederick Osborne regarding something that he calls crypto-eugenics. And this is where you seek to fulfill the aims of eugenics without disclosing what you are really aiming at and without mentioning the word. 
Now, around this time, several powerful organizations which have come to shape the world in which we live today emerged. The first one was called the Conservation Foundation, whose founders included Henry Fairfield Osborne Jr., DeForest Grant, and Lawrence Rockefeller. Now, Fairfield Osborne Jr. was the cousin of the aforementioned Frederick Osborne, and he was also the son of Fairfield Osborne Sr., who co-founded the American Eugenics Society alongside Hitler's hero, Madison Grant. Now, DeForest Grant, he was the younger brother of Madison Grant, who had died 11 years earlier in 1937. And of course, Lawrence Rockefeller, he was the son of the powerful eugenist John D. Rockefeller Jr. The second organization was the Population Council, which was founded by John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s eldest son, John D. Rockefeller III, alongside several other prominent eugenists, most notably Henry Fairfield Osborne Jr.'s cousin, Frederick Osborne, who was then president of the American Eugenics Society. The third organization, which was founded just three weeks after the Population Council, was the International Planned Parenthood Federation, sometimes called Planned Parenthood International. Founding members of the IPPF included American Eugenics Society veteran Margaret Sanger, alongside the aforementioned Carlos Patton Blacker, and the former president of the British Eugenics Society, Vera Houghton. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. Now, in the case of the Conservation Foundation, they managed to turn environmentalism into a movement that is obsessed with so-called overpopulation and invariably population control. They managed to insert their agenda into the education curriculum in grade schools, high schools, and universities. They planted deceptive stories in major media publications, funded major broadcasts and films, conducted science studies that predictably supported their agenda, and they inserted key members into governments and elsewhere that ultimately changed environmental laws. In fact, according to the New York Times, Lawrence Rockefeller alone, he went on to advise more than half a dozen presidents on environmental issues, spanning more than four decades of leadership, guys. Now, worth mentioning is that in 1990, the Conservation Foundation emerged operations with the World Wildlife Fund, which itself was founded by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, a former high-ranking Nazi official and the founder of the Bilderberg Group. Other founders alongside him included Godfrey A. Rockefeller from the other side of the Rockefeller family tree and Julian Huxley, another former president of the British Eugenics Society. You and I are not in the big club. Now, the Population Council was even more influential. John D. Rockefeller III, he managed to convince governments all over the world to begin pursuing population control programs on a scale never seen before. And then Planned Parenthood International, which worked closely alongside the Population Council, they served as one of the most valuable conduits to help carry out these population control programs in other countries, because they presented themselves as family planning and not eugenics or population control. In the coming years, alongside the Population Council, they played a key role in coercive sterilization programs targeting people all around the world, most notably China and India. In India, for example, millions of people were coercively sterilized and at least 1,774 people dying that we know about. And in China, they came to play a significant role in the government's horrific one-child population control program which culminated in 336 million abortions and 196 million sterilizations. Now, this all goes much, much deeper, guys. And in my next video, I will expose how the Gates Foundation fits into all of this. For now, though, you can check out that must-read publication I wrote entitled A History of Elitism, World Government, and Population Control. Now, for those of you who are tight on cash or whatever it might be, I have made a less in-depth version available absolutely free on my website, a new kind of human.com, and also on the freethoughtproject.com. Either way, guys, please make the time to read this because it affects all of us. And more importantly, it affects the future generations still to come. And the key to exposing these psychopaths above all else lies in promoting awareness, which is something that we all can do. So please... Have courage and share this. Till next time.